Hi, everybody, and welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop, UTSA's neuroscience research podcast. Today is Thursday, October 6th, and we're talking to Nicholas Trich, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience and Physiology in the Neuroscience Institute at the New York University School of Medicine. Hi. Nick, hi, Nick. <laughs> Great to have you. Nick's lab uses traditional neurophysiology techniques and lots of even more modern stuff, optical measurements of neural activity and uh, optical measurements of local transmitter release in tissue, which are really interesting things for us to talk about, combined with behavioral measurements to understand how the basal ganglia and some related brain areas control movement and health and disease. Maybe movement and learning and who knows what the basal ganglia does, but it does it in health and disease. And it's a challenging set of questions, and Nick brings the full force of modern neuroscience to bear on it. So welcome, Nick. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And with us today is James Jones, a neuroscience PhD student here at UTSA, who's been on the podcast a few times before. Welcome, James. Hi. So the balance between acetylcholine and dopamine is a great and recurring theme in basal ganglia research. At one time, the imbalance between these two is proposed as being causal in Parkinson's disease, before the days of the direct and indirect pathway. And that's no longer thought to be true, but evidence that the neuromodulators in the stridum are both released tonically all the time, and they have a constant concentration in the tissue, and that they vary in relation to each other, and all of that stuff is something we've known all along. We just never knew enough about it to try to figure out what it meant. So, Nick, you've made the direct measurements of acetylcholine and dopamine levels simultaneously in the same region in the striatum. There's a lot to this, but I'd like to start with just this one part, uh, and then we, we can expand. So, one surprise from this work is that both dopamine and acetylcholine are constantly fluctuating. And what we previously thought of as a relatively constant background level of each one of them turns out to be an enormous oscillation an oscillation at a sort of particular frequency range, which is basically the delta frequency range, which is 0.5 to 4 or so. And um, this is a dopamine, and there's an acetylcholine oscillation. There's really a background tonic either one of them. And they alter in relationship to each other. So would you tell us what's the evidence for that and why this is a new finding, what you did to make us know that? Absolutely. Well, first, thank you for having me. Um, for the, the research that I, that I showed today, we're, we're taking advantage of uh, a class of new molecular sensors that it can be genetically, genetically um, expressed in the striatum, and that let us really peek in at pretty high resolution into the spatial and temporal dynamics of, of dopamine and acetylcholine. And these sensors are fluorescent sensors. Uh, we can use a number of modalities to image them. We've used a technique called fiber photometry, where we use uh, a fiber optic to both shine light into the brain and then collect the fluorescence that these uh, sensors emit. And the, these sensors have been developed in the last few years and have really, I think, revolutionized uh, or and are going to continue to revolutionize our understanding of neuromodulation. Because one of the things about neuromodulators uh, molecules like dopamine, acetylcholine, and, and many others, is that they can be quite tri quite tricky to to measure. When we measure things, um, other transmitters in the brain like GABA and glutamate, we've had the luxury as electrophysiologists to record directly the synaptic currents that these molecules um, produce, and these electrical signals we can record them quickly, precisely, and so we've had a good sense of when these molecules are released. Uh, through the postsynaptic lens, through the lens of the neuron that receives those signals. Modulators like dopamine and acetylcholine, uh, for the most part, signal through metabotropic receptors, which are slow biochemical signaling um, uh, molecules. And, um, and they don't always lead to an electrical signature that we can record. And so um, for molecules like dopamine, there have been great techniques like voltammetry that people have used to great effect to actually record and get a good sense of when dopamine was released, for example, in the brain. But acetylcholine doesn't have a, an electrochemical signature in the way that dopamine does. And so for that, people have mostly relied on the spiking patterns of the neurons that produce acetylcholine, like the cholinergic interneurons of the striatum. 
Um, and so, you know, by looking at the spiking patterns of cholinergic neurons, I think we have had a good idea of when and where um, acetylcholine is released, but mainly still in the context of whatever the experimenter uh, wanted to design the experiment to be. And typically this has been in the context of a, of a reward-based paradigm. Um, and then also in extrapolating the behavior of a single neuron to what, uh, you know, what the release of that transmitter would be. But as you know, of course, there are many steps between the spiking of an action potential to the actual release of the neurotransmitter. Um, and on top of it, factoring in what all the other neurons uh, around them are doing at the same time. And so the, the real advantage of this, this, these new sensors is, one, they're based on the actual receptors that sense acetylcholine or dopamine in the brain. They're expressed from the neurons that normally sense those molecules. And they can give us a real postsynaptic lens through which the, these uh, target neurons are then receiving these signals. Um, and I should mention that in the field of the basic ganglia, there's a bit of, um, you know, there, there's this notion that actually, uh, especially for dopamine, the amount of dopamine that's being released may actually not be really truly reflected in the spiking patterns of the neurons. They're presynaptic. We know of a lot of, of, of course, presynaptic modulation. And that modulation can essentially distort the transfer function between spike rate or spiking and how much transmitter is released. And so there's a real advantage to measuring the extracellular levels of the transmitter directly. And there's no uh, problem with a probe that is damaging the tissue. So one of the things about all the old methods, uh, I mean, I don't want to say anything bad about the old methods because they were great. We learned a lot from them. But even the carbon fiber, but especially the dialysis, microdialysis methods, mm -hmm. is that they create a little microenvironment and they measure the transmitter concentration in that. And that microenvironment is an artificial little bag of yes. fluid that surrounds the probe. And that's I, not I, true for you guys. Well, I'm not, I don't want to say that. Uh, I think every technique has its limits and its caveats. And um, we are implanting a fiber optic, which um, can be several hundred microns, a couple hundred microns in diameter. We use 400 microns, and, and that is a still sizable piece of equipment in so the So do you think you're imaging the acetylcholine and dopamine that's in a fluid space? That, or are you actually focusing down into the tissue and seeing it I do, on the neurons. It's yes, like I do think that the, the sensors are genetically expressed on the neuronal membrane. Mm -hmm. And I think from that perspective, we're uh, respecting uh, sort of those dynamics. But we, we are implanting something and we are creating some damage. And I, I think it, the, the technique is still new and uh, we will learn more as, as we go. But one concern with these sensors is that we are overexpressing a dopamine sensor or a GABAergic or um, a cholinergic sensor, and they, they could competing. and they could be competing for the actual ligand and yeah. in essence dilute or uh, deprive the neurons of They're like a bunker, yeah. dopamine exactly bunker. exactly so that's 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 a, a new concern if you want with with that technique. Yeah. Um, another one is that uh, although I, I think this is the a relevant way of looking at neuromodulation, but by virtue of the technique, we're necessarily looking at a population measure. And we're not able yet, uh, at least with the imaging technique that we're using, to really look at what a single synapse may be seeing. In fact, this is probably mostly not synaptic concentration you're looking at because probably your, your fluorescent uh, indicator doesn't get inserted specifically in the synapses. It's probably that's one. another, yes, that's probably but another. I think of these modulators as especially slowly changing concentrations of modulator as a affecting extrasynaptic receptors. Do you think, are you thinking about it that way? As this is um, what I mean, I, I, receptors are seeing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm hopeful that because we're again using the, 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 the receptors that are normally uh, used, although we're certainly overexpressing them, there's a, a part of me that's wishfully thinking that they get inserted, roughly speaking, where they normally would be. So that seems like an a, a answerable question. 
but I but I do think that we would need to go and and uh, okay. actually look as to where these receptors are uh, expressed at at. Uh, this is an anatomist question. Yes, right? sure. yes, yes. Sure. Yeah, we should do some electron microscopy. So <laughs> probably one thing is the the sensor, like for instance, for acetylcholine, you're using a M3 yes. sensor, right? Yeah. But in the postsynaptic SPN, there is M1, two, three, four, and then there's also N. I was wondering if you could speculate about like the the broad, you know, effects that this signal might have on the postsynaptic neuron, and maybe is there one that might stand out? Um, and now you're talking. So, are the sensors that we're expressing for the most part have been mute or have been mutated to limit both their signaling? So of course, the, the sensor is not supposed to be signaling via G protein. No, no. I guess my my question okay. isn't about the sensor, but uh, kind of piggybacking off of that and, and going into the the effect on the postsynaptic neuron of the actual signal. Yes. Um, we know that they have like a heterogeneity in the type of receptors that respond to this signal. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that you talk about in your work is that this M4 signal is kind of important uh, in the postsynaptic neuron and how it relates with the dopamine signal as well. Um, okay. But there is kind of a, br a breadth of Types of responses. Possibly, M3 receptors have a specific mm -hmm. localization in this cell, mm. right? And so you would be seeing the cholinergic signal that would that they would see. Yes. And so it is true that, as far as I know, the main muscarinic receptor in the striatum is the M3, which will which will distribute to both the direct pathway and the indirect pathway. Mm -hmm. And the M4 uh, type of receptor, which is G alpha I coupled, and that one is thought to mainly be expressed in a in a direct pathway. And I think there's there's good evidence uh, to support that. Um, so the the sensor that we're using is M3 based, um, and but I I personally don't know much about the uh, ability of endogenous receptors to maybe specialize in where they localize. Um, and I I I think that and, and as far as the effect of both of these classes of muscarinic receptors on the physiology of a mm -hmm. of an SPN, there's some work that was that has been done over the years, but it's it's difficult always as with metabotropic receptors because the electrical signature is, is not so clear. We like to depict a D1 receptor with a plus arrow as in depolarizing or increasing the excitability of a D1 neuron or a, or a direct pathway neuron or you know the D2 receptor as having a net inhibitory effect on the indirect pathway neuron. Um, but in fact, none of this is manifest immediately or very clearly when one reports electrophysiologically. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, I think it's important to remember that they're, they're really modulators and that their effects um, are not as easily simplified as a plus or a minus sign. Yeah, so getting back basically to the issue of tonic versus phasic mm -hmm. modulation, there's long been a notion that that there are that these are two distinctly different things. That dopamine has some synaptic effect, which is fast and spike triggered, and then some tonic thing that is slow. The slow thing is important because obviously in Parkinson's disease, when we replace dopamine, we're probably replacing it in a non-specific way, and it's not a spike-driven release of dopamine, in, at least in the usual sense of the word. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we think, wow, with Parkinson's disease, maybe this continuous release of dopamine is really all we need to know about. But it, but it seems to me what you were just saying is there isn't any fast component. They're modulated. So it doesn't matter whether the release is punctate or whether it's not punctate, whether it's whether it's sort of slowly dripping out or it comes out all at once. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, this is where we discussed a bit the, the value of word and, and language. And I mean, the moment a vesicle is released, it's a physic, it's a phasic event. Yeah. Um, in that phasic event, by the time it signals through a metabotropic receptor, it may translate into something that's slowly integrated and becomes a, a tonic kind of signal because it's it gets filtered through a, a slow postsynaptic mechanism. But the, the release of the transmitter itself is something that's phasic. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, the, the discussion of phasic versus tonic, I, I also even presynaptically, maybe originally, uh, well, I don't know if it's original, but another one way to look at it is at the level of spiking. When you look at a neuron in a slice in the presence of synaptic blocker that's just clicking along 
cell autonomously, that is a tonic firing mode. And then there's the synaptically driven Burst, burst or, or pauses, and those tend to be thought of as being phasic. But at the level of the synapse and the vesicular release event, I think there's only one thing, and it's the phasic one. And then how this all comes together to, does it really generate two different modes of signaling? Which one is um, has the information or does what you want it to do? I think that, that those remain valid questions. I'm just wondering, maybe you're seeing slow oscillations. I don't want to fail to get to the slow oscillations, mm. but there are these, what we would, as neurophysiologists, would consider slow, yes. like two hertz kinds of oscillations in dopamine and acetylcholine level. And I would call them both kind of tonic in some sense, mm -hmm. but maybe that's all there is. Maybe what you're seeing is all there is. You've got a sensor in there that should be seeing whatever's there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it is true that your sensor has its own low pass characteristic because it is a G protein coupled event. Yeah. So possibly it filters out the fast stuff. But what do you think? Do you think that do you think that oscillation is all there is? Like for example, let me just take it another step. Like if I was looking at that oscillation in a Parkinsonian animal and I saw mm -hmm. now it's gone because there's no dopamine. Yeah. And I give it L dopa. Yes. What would I get back? Would I just get back a rise in dopamine, or would I start getting this two hertz mm. oscillation? Yes. Yeah, so actually, this was the second part of what I wanted to show, but I didn't get to. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad we're talking about it because I I do think that, um, you know, as we try to conceive of how these molecules are signaling over what time scales, and I think that's important when we ask what does dopamine do, I, you know, when it's being released, and it, it may not be one thing, and it, not, it may not be one thing at different moments in time. So we really need to factor in the temporal component. And um, as you mentioned correctly, in Parkinson's disease, the neurons degenerate, so we certainly have no dopamine left. Um, and one of the things that, uh, and so, in, in, and you're right, then when you take levodopa, for example, which will restore dopamine levels, I always thought of this as sort of restoring some truly flat tone because this is a pharmacological manipulation now. Um, but I, I, I've been maybe surprised or found out that uh, there are many who think that actually we're restoring some of the phasic component as well because uh, levodopa, for example, outperforms dopamine receptor agonists. And one of the ways this has been interpreted is to, to think that, well, maybe what levodopa does is enable phasic release of, of dopamine, in this case, uh, in the brain, potentially uh, from serotonergic fibers or other neurons that are, that are spared, but have the machinery to take up or, or maybe even synthesize, convert uh, levodopa into dopamine, package into vesicles, and release it in a, in a phasic uh, way. So we've... Um, we've We've done the experiment where we trained the mice to do a task that we worked very hard to convince ourselves was a task that would mimic the bradykinesia that uh -huh. Parkinson's uh, people experience. Uh, showed that if we depleted the dopamine, uh, the animal were impaired in the ability to e execute vigorous actions. And if we gave levodopa, they would perform the task uh, vigorously again. And um, and so then we look with fiber photometry to then ask, um, is this signal now phasic or just we've just bumped up the yeah. dopamine? And we have the true tone. And, um, and I guess in that experiment are suggesting that we, you really don't need anything phasic to generate the kind of... You don't need the oscillations, they don't have to come back. That's, that's right. Um, I, I should mention also that in, in recent years, there has been a lot of very convincing papers showing that dopamine levels or dopamine neuron activity is modulated proportionally in the spike rate or in presynaptic calcium levels proportional to the vigor of the movement being produced right and so i, I think these ideas have helped sort of can rekindle this idea that dopamine could invigorate ac an action online through its phasic release and uh, what we're finding is at least in the case of levodopa is that you can restore what look like very vigorous and ballistic movements without restoring the, the phasic dopamine component. So is the oscillation that you see superimposed on a constant value so that we yes. really have both a, there is, a DC component mm -hmm. and this AC component? Certainly, yeah. Which the DC component, though, is uh, 
always difficult to evaluate. And one of the limitations I want to say of fiber photometry is unlike voltammetry, we cannot deconvolve our signal into a, a micromolar amount or a nanomolar amount of dopamine. But what we have been able to do is um, to uh, supplement or treat the animal with, for example, a dopamine receptor blocker, which will, in essence, block the sensor. And we can do this within an experiment and see both that we're losing the phasic oscillations, but that we're also have some loss of, of tone in essence. And so I so think I don't I, I think things like are bad. So we we have waves riding on top of some ocean and uh, when it comes to movement, I am more and more convinced that the ocean or the lake, depending how deep it is, is necessary for actions to go through. Uh -huh. But the wavelets on top are I don't think necessary. And certainly not sufficient to to produce a vigorous action. So how about the acetylcholine? Because there's a long story about acetylcholine and dopamine being sort of opposite in function in Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so you also see these same oscillations in acetylcholine in yeah. exactly the same frequency range. And in fact, they're phase locked to each other a lot of the time. And uh, is there also a DC component of the acetylcholine? There is. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm. So we Absolutely. could have, a, a, we could have, like, go back to 1978 or something, <laughs> yeah. have this sort of balance between the DC component of acetylcholine and dopamine yes. being important in Parkinson's disease. So we've looked at this model that you're proposing because I, I think stemmed, as is oftentimes the case in neuropsychiatry, our models, our neuronal models are based on what works in the clinic yeah. and how we think these drugs are working. And so one of the first lines of treatment against Parkinson's disease, for Parkinson's disease that showed some efficacy were these muscarinic receptor blockers. Mm. And because blocking acetylcholine led to some clinical improvements, mm. there came the idea that, well, we must have too much acetylcholine. Yeah. Then, of course, later on, we found out that really the main culprit was the loss of dopamine and in, in order to reconcile these two ideas, that maybe, well, when dopamine is low, maybe acetylcholine is high. Yeah. And since then, a, a lot of work in SLICE has supported this sort of mutually antagonistic relationship between these two neurotransmitters, such that, that this idea is, is sort of uh, persevered. Um, so we also looked at mice in which we had lost uh, dopamine through a, a, a lesion. And uh, we didn't find any differences in how much acetylcholine was floating around or even the, the, the nature of those um, oscillations riding on top of the, the tone. So um, we think this is a case of uh, that, that, that we, couldn't, we can't assume that acetylcholine was abnormally high, but it's just a case that the antagonist worked, maybe because we did have an an imbalance between the dopamine and acetylcholine. Normally, they're both sitting at the same level. In Parkinson's, dopamine falls into the basement, and acetylcholine is, relatively speaking, higher than dopamine, but not abnormally high. And in using a muscarinic receptor antagonist, we end up bringing acetylcholine down to the same level as dopamine, which may help for some of the symptomatic relief. But we, we can't or shouldn't conclude that, that acetylcholine was abnormally high. And so I, uh, the, this, this antagonism, again, that we see very clearly in SLICE, uh, in vitro, um, we haven't seen a lot of evidence for it in vivo, even when we do pretty extreme manipulations like removing the dopamine neurons. So normally, if I'd ask somebody, some stridal neurophysiologist, how do dopamine and acetylcholine interact to control the, the neuron in stridum? The story I will probably get is a story not really about how they make the cells fire faster or slower, but how they alter synaptic plasticity. Mm -hmm. So they have antagonistic, antagonistic effects on LTP, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure whether, should I think that the, that imbalance in Parkinson's disease is an imbalance of synaptic plasticity? or which would be incredibly interesting if yes. that was it. Yes. Uh, maybe you just summarize a little bit about the antagonism that they have in synaptic plasticity and striatum. I know it's a complicated story, and there's a lot of different nuances <laughs> to it. Um, and earlier, I asked you about it, and yeah, you dodged I mean, it I... just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unintentionally. <laughs> um, 
I mean, I, I, other than to say that the, the signaling cascades, at, at least when we think of uh, the D1 type dopamine receptor and the M4 type muscarinic receptors are mutually antagonistic. So here's one more reason to think that, you know, they would have this antagonistic relationship. Um, and and so talking that signaling pathway. Yes. They're antagonistic on what? On, 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 on subkinase or something. Oh, great. Okay, yes. So they, they one activates, uh, uh, would lead to the activation of protein kinase A, which would go on to, um, you know, increase the activity or decrease the activity of a number of effector proteins. And the muscarinic uh, M4 type receptor is thought to antagonize that very same protein kinase A. And so in that way, they're directly antagonistic to one another. So one of the reasons for bringing up the synaptic plasticity thing is because protein kinase A doesn't have any obvious effect on firing rate. That's right. right? Not in a medium. So yes. the fact that they're antagonistic in controlling protein kinase A doesn't tell you that one will make the cell speed up and the other makes them slow down. That's right. So what it does tell you is that they're gonna one of them is gonna enhance LTP Yes, and, and protein kinase A is very clearly implicated in plasticity mechanisms. Some of the substrates that it phosphorylates are things like NMDA receptors, AMPA receptors, but from fruit flies to, uh, you know, mammals, protein kinase A is a, a sort of a memory substrate and, and one that, you know, is thought to be required for dopamine to do uh, not just changes in intrinsic excitability, something that could happen relatively quickly, but really change the strength of synaptic connections for long-term plasticity. So this is what really excites me about seeing these oscillations, because, because the dopamine and the acetylcholine are out of phase mm -hmm. with each other, and both of them going at about two hertz, mm -hmm. then every half a section, second, there's a little window mm -hmm. that's where dopamine sort of owns the space yes. and where synaptic plasticity ought to be enhanced. And another little window that's going to be acetylcholine dominated, where you might think maybe the opposite kind of synaptic plasticity mm -hmm. would be enhanced. Oh. So there's kind of time sharing between enhancing and, and depressing synaptic transmission. The things that happen in that little window are determining which one is running when. Is that is that a fair? I, I would mean, love it if I would love it if that were true, and that is my, uh, yeah, my my pet uh, project or idea right now, because I I you know grew up thinking about LTP as something that you apply a barrage of of stimulation, and if you're, and a lot of the LTP experiments, you know, through if, because of technical limitations, not because people didn't want to do it differently, implied bath applying a dopamine agonist or antagonist and doing high frequency stimulation of that synapse and seeing what would happen. Um, and I, I think that then leads to these ideas of plasticity and long term plasticity being these relatively fixed and stable properties. But I, there's also a lot of evidence in vivo that the brain changes in a context dependent manner very quickly. Um, but also that, you know, maybe dopamine is not going to be high for, you know, several minutes in a row. And that the, the I think it's, it's a way to bridge maybe what we know also to be true in, in spike timing dependent plasticity. That is the timing of a spike relative to uh, the postsynaptic depolarization or something is something that, that is really important for dictating LTP versus LTD at some synapses. Uh, but maybe for neuromodulation as well, where if the levels are fluctuating constantly and those levels play a role in, in determining whether you're going to have LTP or LTD, then this, the timing of that synaptic input relative to the levels of dopamine and acetylcholine could play a very important role. I would like to think that. I mean, I, uh, we'll have to see. This kind of goes back. Maybe I jumped the gun with my question earlier, but um, so this this idea here is relying on the idea on the idea that the m4 receptor is mediating a lot of this mm -hmm. but these postsynaptic spns express kind of m1 and 3 and 5 and these have different effects than 2 and 4 is there how how do we amend that i mean is there like a differential expression in different types of these spns or maybe a subset express m4 and so those are <laughs> 
maybe I misspoke earlier when I said M. Yeah, I said M three, but I think the two major types in the striatum are M one, M one, and M four, and M four. And M one is thought to be in both direct and indirect pathway MSNs, and that's the one that's GQ coupled, and so it's it's it signals through a non PKA dependent uh, pathway. Uh, it's PKC, and um, I actually don't know much about how uh, PKC would influence the the physiology of either direct or indirect pathway neurons, but they at least don't fit into that very classical tug of war between the GS and the GI mm -hmm. signaling pathways that they're fighting for PKA, which is key for, for plasticity. And the M4 receptor, which is GFI coupled, is um, mainly expressed in direct pathway uh, mm -hmm. neurons. And the indirect pathway have another tug of war that one between the D2 receptors, which is GL5I right. couple, and the adenosine receptor, which is GL5S coupled. And I think there are new sensors now, fluorescent sensors, for looking at the levels of adenosine. And I'm curious so to see isolate, yeah. which are, you know, maybe contributed by astrocytes or things like this. Are those, what are the dynamics of this neuromodulation and, and how should we think about plasticity maybe on the ISPNs through this tug of war between these two neuromodulators? So there's one neuron's window for LTP may correspond to a different window, neuron's window for LTD. Right. Which and would I, be amazing. Yes. And I, I think, you know, all these years thinking about the direct pathway and the indirect pathway, they're yin and yang, and why have both? But in the end, I think more and more work is showing that they may be specializing for different types of learnings. Uh, the, the indirect pathway neurons may be specialized at detecting when dopamine levels fall because they, they get disinhibited in a sense. But they get plasticity through PKA2 just at the time when dopamine is low. Um, whereas the direct pathway may undergo LTD at that time and it may undergo LTP when dopamine is high. So. Instead of looking at them as being redundant, we could look at them as uh, specialized sensors for learning at, at, under different circumstances. These kind of ideas of there being a clock and that different phases of the clock enable different things in learning, it's a uh, common idea in the uh, hippocampus, for example, and uh -huh. it's been in the cerebellum as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I clock-driven mechanism requires is somebody to take advantage of it. So for example, if there's a moment of a window of opportunity for LTP, then the right signal needs to be there at that moment mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and not at during the moment when LTP is turned off. Mm -hmm. So if there's, if what we're looking for are two hertz, uh, as a two hertz clock, then we could ask, does anybody else in the vicinity talk in this two hertz language? Mm -hmm. And one of the remarkable things about it is that we already know the answer to that is yes. <laughs> Every place around there talks in this delta language, you know, in some to some degree. All of the inputs to the striatum are are you know being turned on and turned off on these kinds of. I'm happy things. to hear you say that. <laughs> Uh, I mean, one of the things that's difficult with the MSNs, uh, the, the striatal neurons, is that they're so sparsely active that it takes sampling for a really long time. And I don't think they would have this sort of uh, very periodic, this periodicity is not going to be obvious on a, on a cycle by cycle basis. They, they definitely, I don't think it would jump out. But um, having these uh, oscillations of fluctuations in dopamine and acetylcholine in the background allows us to now ask when is a given MSN firing in relationship to that endogenous uh, neuromodulatory milieu? And could it be that um, if one neuron is constantly firing within a given phase of that uh, oscillation, that it could transform its own physiology in response to that? I think what I, I get that it. does happen is in sleep. You mentioned in sleep. Uh, all of the striatal neurons are following a yes, frequency. Yes, you're right, like you're that. right, you're right. So uh, you're right. possibly there's a... a yeah, interestingly, connection. you know, you mentioned also in sleep that the neurons don't really spike all that much, but maybe you don't even need the spiking. What you do need is the depolarization, and you, those depolarizations are driven synaptically. And so you have the synapses, you have the modulators, and, and that may be uh, all that you need. Um, you mentioned the parallel with the hippocampus before, which I, I love, and it's one of the systems that, that, that I admire. Um, 
But a, a question that came up on your show uh, another time was, you know, what is the value of a theta oscillation if there's no one to read it? And um, I would like to think that our oscillations will allow us to learn about spiral physiology in the way that we learn from theta. And I rejoice in the fact that the fluctuations that we're describing are actually neuromodulators, which we know have effects on the cells that they uh, talk to. And so, yes, it's an oscillation. Maybe the spiking has a relationship to it. But in that case, it's a, maybe easier to imagine how that oscillation would affect the physiology as opposed to the theta, which is maybe some people argue is an epiphenomenon. And who knows if it has a real impact on, on the physiology. Ooh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's a great. I just I, I, stop and I, let all of our. I'm not saying that I believe it, but I'm saying that I've, I've heard I've heard that mentioned. I've heard, I've heard that that's criticism. Been yes. That's been said. Okay, great. I like I sort of love this as a way for us to finish because it brings us back to like common themes in the podcast that we have visited many times, but this time. The striatum as the star of the oscillations. Yes. So thanks very much. Thank Nick, you for having me. This was fun. And thanks, James, for being sure. with us. And this has been Neuroscientist Talk Shop. Mm -hmm.